I think that if you identify with Gaia as opposed to identifying with an individual species, then there is a sense in which we uh, do have a kind of immortality. You know, as Carl Sagan said, Earth is where we make our stand. But I think that's true about we as contemporary humans. But as, you know, as agents of the biosphere in the long run, I do think that we're uh, going to be around for a long time, maybe even sort of the rest of the life of the planet. And, and therefore, we'll have time to uh, figure out also how to expand off planet. The scientific revolution starts now. We interrupt this message to bring you another very important message. This podcast, it's made possible because we're supported by patrons like you at Patreon at Demystify Sci. Today on the show, we are talking about one of my favorite topics, which is intelligence. I have spent hundreds of hours talking with folks, trying to get to the bottom of what that word even means. And today we're actually talking about planetary intelligence. So we have Dr. David Grinspoon, an astrobiologist on the show, to speak about a recent paper that he collaborated with uh, Sarah Walker and Adam Frank on discussing the modern, updated mm, landscape of planetary intelligence as it stands. Uh, but first, I kind of wanted to ask you, David, how you got into all of this. Have you always, since you were a little kid, been interested in life in space? Or what, what's the road to somebody uh, becoming you know, interested in these topics? How did it work out for you? What was it like being a kid? I, in some ways, uh, I have the very kind of cliche story of uh, space scientists of of my generation, uh, you know, one of my earliest memories was um, seeing the uh, astronauts land on the moon, um, Apollo 11, uh, when I was in the fourth grade. Um, and, um, you know, it, it blew my young little mind and um, got me very excited about space. And, uh, you know, I was a science fiction geek and a kind of space fan from an early age and just, uh, followed the, you know, when I was a teenager, we had the first ever missions, uh, spacecraft to Mars and, uh, first ever, um, spacecraft to Venus and to the outer solar system happening. And, you know, all these firsts, and it felt like, um, the universe was sort of expanding in real time as far as our, our, uh, knowledge of it. Um, and so, were people pretty was, hopeful that there was going to be life found on those planets as they went out back then? I, I think that kind of oscillated um, because, I mean, I was very steeped in science fiction. So, of course, I, I, I knew there would be life <laughs> out there. Um, but, you know, um, I, when the space age started, uh, I think there was this general expectation that uh, the planets would be more Earth-like than they really are. And... Um, and that there may well be life. We thought maybe there was vegetation on Mars. It turned out it wasn't, you know, at least the, the markings that we thought were, and that Venus is a much more hostile place than we had thought to our kind of life. So there was a sort of initial rush of disappointment. And then our ideas about life may be caught up with that when we realized, oh, life can exist in more extreme places than we thought. And we don't have to be so Earth-like, uh, Earth-focused in our, 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 our geocentric in our ideas about life. So, so, so all that was happening. And I just knew I wanted to be a space scientist um, and I had some, you know, sort of influence uh, mentors when I was young that um, pushed me in that direction. And then that led me to planetary science. Um, and I was definitely interested in what was called exobiology at the time, which was sort of a really a fringe of planetary science the, you know, the few scientists, Carl Sagan and others who dared talk about life elsewhere, but it wasn't a central part of the field. But, uh, but why, was, why do you, why do you think there's so much resistance to that initially? Like what, what is fundamentally unscientific about considering biology in a bigger context than locally? I think a lot of it had to do honestly with NASA's sort of self image and not as like serious to... scientists. Yes. But what's exactly. what's unserious about it? That's what I'm trying it's to understand. Speculative. Yeah. I think that scientists tend to shy away. Any we see this on the podcast all like, the time. You get no somebody evidence. to start not, speculating yeah. about something that there isn't hard evidence for, mm. and people get very uncomfortable very quickly. Yeah, and and you know the origins of planetary science also was there was this um, this sense among astronomers even that planetary science wasn't respectable. 
that, uh, you know, that, that real astronomers studied the stars and galaxies. So I think there was maybe a little bit of a built in insecurity in planetary science of like, well, we don't want to seem that far out. And then and then there was also, you know, in the 50s and 60s, there was like all the like UFO hype. And, uh, we, oh, we're, you know, we're not those people, we're serious scientists. So, so the association with searching for extraterrestrial life um, had, it had associations that scientists didn't um, see as part of their self image. Um, and that, that changed later on, but that's definitely um, how I got into it. And then, you know, as far as intelligence, um, you know, well, there's, there's SETI, the question of uh, a search for extraterrestrial intelligence, which was always a, a draw for me. And then, and then all these sort of science fiction ideas, but um, I was more generally just a science geek. So, you know, when you start learning about evolution, um, you start really getting into this question of what is it about humans that is so different and is it really so different um and how do you define what that is and somehow and uh, the word intelligence you know whatever that is oh, <laughs> uh, come, we'll get to that in those discussions <laughs> yeah there does seem to be something at least extreme about the way humans are in relation to all the other life forms um which does sort of circle around this idea of intelligence to some extent and, and i think that it has to do with the ability to abstractly uh, consider things to make new concepts, you know, especially when in the context of artificial intelligence, it's like th at some point the, the little bots have to come up with their own ideas in order to really be intelligent. Is that what you guys, that, that is, from what I understand, I mean, this is a loaded question. It doesn't seem like that's exactly what you guys mean in your paper when you're talking about planetary scale intelligence. Well, um, I mean, first of all, I agree with you. I think abstraction is a real key to um, what distinguishes human intelligence from other kinds of intelligence. But I guess it depends on how broadly we want to use the word, because I wouldn't um, I wouldn't say that other animals, you know, and maybe even plants, we can get into that, but certainly other other life forms that have some degree of what we would call intelligence, you know, the ability to, uh, you know, having cognitive systems and solving problems uh, and behaving in response to uh, stimulate, you know, there's a lot of things we can talk about, you know, I, my, my dog Jasper, um, I think has intelligence, but I don't think he does a lot of abstracting. I think so. It's more like it's more like attention or something. Would you would you say it's like closer to attention or you know the the ability to uh, I, I want to. I like. I I have this feeling that it has something to do with goal oriented problem solving mm -hmm. in this way. Where so it's like something that I saw the other day is that there was a chart of heartbeat versus life expectancy, and if you look. Animals from whales to hamsters to tigers to mice, they're all on this neat curve where as you as your heart rate decreases, your lifespan increases. And then way off in the corner, there's humans. And to me, that's a sign of the fact that humans have decided that we want to live for longer and we are going to figure out how to change biology in such a way that we will escape these natural limitations that other organisms have. Yeah, I, I wonder if you uh, on that chart, if you put in the life expectancy of humans um, like 300 years ago or 500 years yeah, ago or even I, I was going to say uh, 100,000 years ago. But when we were more or less anatomically the same, but before we had, um, you know, become uh, technologically um, our life spans had become technologically enhanced for all kinds of reasons the way they are now probably from like years you're right would would do it but that'd be that'd be interesting but yeah we've we've um made ourselves outliers in uh some interesting ways for sure and, and that's kind of what you mean by planetary intelligence though is like the ability for the planet to sustain itself almost in this like is it a technological intentional thing? way yeah yeah, so that's a good question. So we, you know, so I first came across this term, I, I started using the term planetary intelligence when I was, I was working on a book that I wrote called Earth and Human Hands. And the point of that book was to look at the Anthropocene, the, the phase of human um, influenced geological evolution that we're apparently in now, in the context of long term planetary evolution and try to from a astrobiological perspective, say what's what's different about us, what's different about now, and um, 
the thing that I really kept coming back to the the aspect of our existence is that it's not that we're just another geological force. We're the first geological force aware of its own existence. And that creates the possibility for some kind of feedback where that awareness can actually guide our behavior in a way that wasn't possible before we had that awareness. And that's when I first started using the phrase planetary intelligence. So I meant something specific by it there. And then when I did that paper with Adam and Sarah, I, I think we expanded out on it a little bit to talking about different phases. But there's a kind of planetary intelligence we talked about that was probably here long before humans were here. And then you, you know, you get into like the Gaia picture of Earth, where if there are feedback loops um sort of acting in response to information and tweaking the behavior of the system in certain ways so as to maintain some kind of desirable state. You can look at that as um, some kind of a intelligence, some kind of a cognitive system, the way an individual organism that doesn't abstract the way the way we do, but maybe has some, you know, sort of um, nervous system where it takes in information and makes decisions to to be able to survive. And that, you know, that's a a level of intelligence. And we um, realized that there were behaviors of the planet with life, but before humans and technology that had some characteristics um, in common with an organism with a basic um, intelligent behavior. So, so we talked about that as a certain level. And then the interesting question is, what does it mean for planetary intelligence when you have humans and um, global, globally influential technology. And even, even with that, we decided there were multiple levels. There's the level of um, sort of inadvertent changes that we've mostly been in where, where you have these um, clever creatures doing things to the planet, but not really aware of what they're doing to the planet. But then if you develop that awareness and the global activities start reflecting that awareness, then you've got um, a, uh, a more sophisticated kind of intelligence um, and a different mode of behavior. Um, and that's the kind of planetary intelligence that we, uh, uh, certainly in my book, and I think a little bit in our paper, we imply that you know, it would be, would be a healthy thing to seek. Um, because that's where you get the, the sort of feedbacks on your behavior that uh, leads to potentially more, um, more longevity and less uh, of a sort of self-destructive kind of uh, mode. So, um, And it would make so, sense that that would take a significant amount of time and iteration, because I, I always I have a tendency to look at things as being uh, reflected in each other at scale. And so I feel like the evolution of intelligence on the planet is similar to the evolution of intelligence in an organism, where when you're young, you make a lot of stupid decisions and you have no idea what you're doing. And then as you get older, you start to understand how things fit together and then you're able to make better decisions. And I feel like planetary intelligence is in its adolescence right now. Yeah, no, exactly. If not that's, infancy. That's a, really, that's a really good point. And that's a th that's what you just said is, I think, very similar to the way we look at it. Because one of, I, I mentioned those different levels, and I didn't say the word right now, but in our paper and in my book, we talk about mature versus immature planetary intelligence. And there is an analogy, even with with a, a maturing individual, you could say that you have sort of a, what, what are the hallmarks of adolescent intelligence? Well, you don't necessarily think through the consequences of your, your actions. You know, that's, that's the cliche, you know, clean up your room, <laughs> you know, and, um, and, uh, you know, the, the connection of cause and effect, um, is, is not really there. It's more, uh, less situational awareness, more, uh, seeking immediate, um, returns immediate gratification and the, the sort of more mature level is there's an awareness of consequence and that is sort of folded into um, action and so I think that I think the uh, the metaphor of childhood and adolescence um, and then maturity is a good one for these potentially different uh, mechanisms and levels of planetary intelligence so then does that mean that the planet as a whole struggles with the same sort of crisis of meaning that people struggle with of you know what is the point? That's well, a great question. You know, the planet as a whole, it's tricky when you start talking about these things, because I think there are 
planetary scale problems that require planetary scale solutions and ways that we can look at planetary scale mechanisms. But um, of course, humanity is um, complicated and not everybody's the same and not we're not all doing and thinking the same thing. And some places are more privileged and some, you know, it's like it's when you actually look on the ground and say, you know, you start saying we are this and we do that. And then you could say, well, wait a minute, who's we, who do you mean? You know, do you mean like um, rich white Americans or do you mean uh, we all of humanity? And then, you know, so I, I can't help but responding that way to your question. Cause when we talk about sort of the whole planet aspiring to something or um, having a thought, I mean, I'm very drawn to that whole planet idea of cognition. And I think there's a level at which it's, true but there's also levels at which the you know the the reality the granular reality is a messy thing of course you could say that about it's interesting about if you look at neurons too. too okay yeah you're gonna say the <laughs> yeah, same thing yeah, exactly we're, we're jinx <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> it's like you have to sum the signals right so each neuron's getting lots of different voices in its ear and and it has to make a decision at some point and it's yeah no, it that, seems that's to... absolutely right so so it may be like i'm saying all oh, the reality is messy and granular but if you if you if you could suddenly dive into a a, a brain and, and look around you and go, oh, is this a coherent? Thing? Nobody agrees on anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's noisy and, and fractious, you know, so maybe it's maybe it is similar in that way. And then and then and then out of that arises some sort of consensus thought. Right. And so maybe globally, that is what's happening. But it's hard for us to see it being being neurons. <laughs> well, there well, is it... the th there is the idea of the zeitgeist too, because I think that that's what, like the, the the Overton window. The, I, the Overton window is a little bit different. I'm thinking more of Newton and Leibniz discovering calculus at the same mm -hmm. time, where I'm like that to me is the output of this level of general intelligence where everybody has agreed that these are the things that we're thinking about. This is what we're talking about. And this is the way to solve the problem. Mm. And so people yeah. stumble there, onto there the are next like, level. There are ideas that are sort of in the air or that make sense to, there are thoughts that make sense to have now given what has been thought and said recently and that anybody could have them or collectively we may have them. And so, yeah, I think you're right. What seems like an individual um, occurrence to, to us, because we can't help having that mind frame, uh, looked at at a different scale, maybe some kind of a more collective uh, process. Mm -hmm. So would that make the human beings the, something like the sense organ of this hypothetical organism? Something like that, but you could also um, say that, um, you know, I I have this picture of um, in the last uh, 50 years, we've been surrounding the planet with all of these um, satellites, many of which are, some of which are looking out, but many of which are looking back in and we're doing this, we've sort of evolved this new organ Planet Earth has evolved this new sensory organ, um, which is like this um, almost like a mycelium of connected satellites that are radioing signals and and sensing um, what's happening on the planet. And then ideally, those um, sensory inputs are um, alerting us to problems and changes that we should be aware of and acting like um, the sort of self-sensing organ that allows us to more uh, maybe more intelligently um sort of handle our own presence here on the planet and they're reaching out too which is quite interesting because it's hard to imagine an organism existing in isolation like you you don't usually define a species by one organism right it would be like you 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 generally have communities so if the earth is to be treated as an organism we should almost definitely expect other organisms to be of its same family to be out there and obviously interested in one another as well, life forms tend to be. If you look at a neuron in a dish, that's exactly what happens. If you have a single neuron, you can watch as it as it sends out its pseudopods and they look like little hands and they're basically looking around to see who they can connect with mm. and how they can start to form this network. Absolutely. And we have certainly been, um, again, in the last uh, 50, 60, 70 years, um, sending out little bits of earth um, <laughs> with sensors to the rest of the solar system and kind of 
exploring our surroundings, sending out pseudopods, if you like, um, to uh, to the neighboring worlds. So there there is some analogy there. I mean, I think you got to be a little bit careful with argument by analogy. Uh, I mean, it's interesting and you can gain insights from it for sure. But it's also sort of it's a weak form of argument to say, therefore, it must be sure. like this because it's kind of like this other thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. There's exceptions all over the place. So you have to be careful. Yeah. Um, it but just... it's certainly a good it's a good source of of, of insight because it can help sort of change your frame, which is which we need a lot of that. And and NASA and ex all the space explorers in general are looking for life actively. Like and so. But they don't have a DNA sequencing machine on the new rover, which I don't understand. <laughs> well, so, that? I mean, that's a good question. Are we really looking for life? Mm, um, mm. Astrobiology has be has. I mentioned, you know, exobiology was was sort of a fringe thing when planetary science was new in the sixties, seventies, really eighties, and then starting in the nineteen nineties, astrobiology became a thing because we discovered several sort of promising. Uh, there were several discoveries made in the late 1990s, which collectively sort of changed our attitude about the possibility of life elsewhere. And so astrobiology went from being a fringe to being kind of central to NASA's mission. And now it's very much what we talk about. But you're right. We don't really have life sensors on our spacecraft. Um, we talk a lot about characterizing conditions to look for habitability and understand the history of habitability. And, you know, there's different opinions about that. Some people think that's smart because we don't really know how to build a life sensor yet without really assuming too much about what we're looking for. Some people say that was the problem with Viking, which was our one life seeking uh, mission that we didn't really know what we were doing. It was laden with assumptions. Well, we don't have a definition for life yet, which is a bit annoying. So that, that, that's that's true. That's true. Um, but, you know, but other people think, well, we're just chickening out and we really should send life sensors. Uh, I think, but, you know, there's some validity to both points of view, but absolutely we can't define life. And, you know, really, we probably won't be able to find life until I won't be able to define life until we find life and understand really what it has in common on more than one world. And that's sort of an interesting paradox. How can you search for something that you can't define, but how can you define something that you know that you haven't found yet <laughs> so and and i think that people have are actually genuinely shocked if you look at the history of astronomy that they don't find like everybody expected there to be life on all of the other planets from what i can tell at least as they were discovered you know they had different even hypotheses about what their cultures would be like i think uh who was it some guy was looking at uh, originally looking at jupiter and figured that since it had so many oceans that their continents must be full of hemp because they needed right. to grow grow sail or they needed to grow the hemp to make sails for all of the rigging that they would need. So yeah, uh, yeah, I mean there's a lot of there's a lot of uh literature like that where people deduced, you know, the people on Mars must be tall because gravity's lower and you know, all oh, there's a whole lot of that and you know, when we first discovered that the other planets were planets and not just moving lights in the sky, we didn't know anything about them other than the fact that they were worlds like Earth and they were in the, suddenly in the same category as our own planet. And since we didn't know anything else about them, it was natural to uh, impart Earth-like qualities and creatures to them. And so that was sort of the assumption, you know, before really even we uh, had telescopes to, um, you know, good telescopes to understand what the planets were like. And then when we first had telescopic images, we interpreted things as sort of life hopeful. We saw markings on Mars and we said, those are canals, or we saw ch seasonal changes. We said, those are, that's vegetation. Um, until fairly recently, that. right? This is yes. up until the seventies right or something. Yeah. Right up until we started sending spacecraft there, there were people that still said there's probably vegetation. And then, and then those first spacecraft pictures and, ins and measurements were very disappointing. Yeah. That must've been heartbreaking. I can just imagine people just slamming their heads on the desk like this. Oh, yeah. Geez. It, it, in fact, if you look at the, um, I've done some of this, if you look at the newspaper coverage um, from, you know, the first mission to Venus, which showed that, oh, no, there's not, no oceans there. It's really hot. It was Mariner 2, 
1961. And the New York Times, uh, with the way they reported this, they said, Venus says no. This, <laughs> marks the, this marks the beginning of the end of mankind's grand romantic dreams. That's oh literally what they said. <laughs> and something similar when, when uh, Mariner 4 first went by Mars and they saw that it was cratered and looked like the moon and it wasn't you know, this sort of Lowellian paradise. Uh, similarly, the newspapers said, you know, this is horrible. This is a disappointment. <laughs> you know? So that I think that it bummer. does make sense, though, because there's a moment where you of potential where you look out at the solar system and you believe that you aren't alone. And then all of a sudden you look closer and I can like hear the sound of the wind, you know, the solar wind in space and just the like the dramatic Hans Zimmer chord of you are alone. And that's a horrible realization. So I understand the drama. Of or it. your neighbors are really far away, you know, which is equally yeah. depressing, yeah. perhaps. I mean, but there, it, there was something, you know, sort of naively comforting about the idea that there might be similar places. You know, it's like a kind of heaven, uh, you know, C.S. Lewis uh, <laughs> stories uh, that it, on the other nearby planets. And then, the, yeah, it was a disappointment that it wasn't like that. But or then, even the fact that there's a frontier, right? Like, I, do, I, yeah. I know that it's it's very, the, it's it's hard to talk about the frontier without talking about colonialism and extraction and abuse and slavery and everything else. But I think that we are in a weird place psychologically because for the very first time, there is nowhere to explore in a way where you can just get on a horse and go. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I that is the history of our species. I mean, you know, you, you don't have to talk about the, you know, the, the uh, colonial um, era, which we do sort of, uh, unfortunately associate with the notion of a frontier, but you go back further, you know, and there was a time when all humans were in Africa and then we started spreading around the planet. And that's, that's sort of our history is to, uh, is to go live in new places and figure out how to, how to live in new places. And we, we're not really doing that now. Um, and, and I wonder if the free floating um, anxiety of our time is not partially due to that, where it's like we hoped that perhaps these planets would be a place where we could go and we could continue building the dream of humans as an interplanetary species. And now you look at it and, and you're like, well, going there would be the equivalent of going to hell. And it's like, I suppose yeah, we could a, go there, a, but it's an interesting idea. I mean, certainly, you know, th there was the sense of optimism in the early exploration of the solar system that, you know, that I was describing as a youth, I was very caught up in. And the idea was in the, the future was part of this utopian vision where not only would we be, there'd be humans living, you know, we, I thought 2001 was realistic when it came out and I was a kid, you know, we not only would be, we'd be off with Jupiter and other places, but we would also be cooperating with, um, you know, our geopolitical enemies. And we'd be, you know, there'd be, it was part of this idea that humanity would progress to this in this more unified way. And not only did the planets turn out to be more alien than um, we imagined, but like we're certainly going through a time right now uh, when um, the uh, humanity does not seem to be um, uniting in a way that's going to make it easy to solve our global problems. So, you know, I guess there are many possible uh, sources for that free form anxiety you described, but certainly the solar system uh, is not, you know, as welcoming as some of us had perhaps naively fantasized. Yeah. And so uh, where does like where does that where does that leave us, right? Because we do have these programs to go and to settle, but it seems like they are inherently going to be on the scale of colonial projects rather than on the scale of the individual groups of humans deciding that they're going to go out because I can't imagine anything beyond a state level or, you know, wealthiest person on earth level project that starts a colony on a different planet. Yeah, even with that, it's not going to be something that's a significant movement of human beings um, for quite some time. Um, by the way, I've personally stopped using the word colony and colonializ colonialization when I talk about space. And I understand there are there are uses of that word that that are completely benign. Like you can talk about, um, you know, um, organisms in a Petri dish colonizing the next Petri dish over. It's a biological. It's a microbiologist. But, yeah. Yeah. But but because people have these associations with it and it's fraught, 
rather than have that conversation every time and put in that disclaimer, I've just found that it's easier to say other, use other words. So I, what words you know, do you well, use? I would love, I would love, cause I'm like settling colonialism mm -hmm. frontier. Yeah, I mean, I was using, I, I started using settling because I think that's much better. And then of course people come back and say, oh, <laughs> as somebody who's settler, Jewish, I'm like, uh, settler, yeah. settler colonialism, but you know, but it's like that to me, that's a weaker association. It's like, you could, almost any word you can find some negative association, but then, but actually because of that, I often say inhabiting, like mm. when we inhabit Mars or mm. inhabit, you know, or even like the peopling of, um, of space, you know? So uh, there are workarounds. Like <laughs> Those are the workarounds so I use. Let's talk a little bit about what are the habitable planets and how freaking far away are these things? Like, is this, and these are theoretically habitable planets the oh, yeah, same yeah. way that are Mars... Are there any even? Yeah. yeah, I don't know a ton about this. I'm just curious. Well, okay, so so it depends on what we mean by habitable. Sorry to go back to the to yeah, let's semantics. Do it. But, but um, you know, because people talk about Earth 2.0. Mm. I, I don't believe there is an Earth 2.0. That's words, not good. Th there will be... Well, it depends on, you know, I don't think it's necessarily bad. I just mean... Uh, I, and I don't mean by that, I don't mean there's no other places that humans could ever go and live, but I don't think there's another planet that's going to be so similar to Earth that it's going to be sort of like a Star Trek world where we can say, oh, it's a it's a breathable atmosphere, Captain, and sort of beam down and and say, oh, the fruit tastes pretty good. You know, it's, it's kind of sweet, I, you know, because evolution is so random. And the more we learn about planets. Uh, the more we learn that in a way, planet, what I say is planets are more like people than they are like protons. In other words, protons, uh, you know, no two are different. They're all the same. But people, no two are alike. Uh, and I think. But they are of a species, like though, are they not? Are yes. the people are yes. of a species, right? So oh, absolutely. You no, could there more. All yeah. people, there are things that all people have in common. And there's some people that are very much alike, um, like identical twins. And there will be planets that are more alike than others. But I'm just saying. Uh, are we finding be, any of those? Well, we're, you know, we're at the beginning of finding exoplanets, which sounds funny because you say, oh, we found 5,000. But, you know, there are literally, we know, um, billions in, in our uh galaxy alone and we're just starting to get a good look at them and the ones we've been able to see best the ones we've been able to find it's very biased towards non-earth like ones um because they're bigger and they have smaller orbits which you know they torque around their stars more and mm. they block more light so we're just really getting to the point now where we're building up the demographics of more earth-like planets to understand that question and it's clear that there are planets that are rocky and roughly earth-sized in the you know the habitable zones of their stellar systems, meaning in a zone where you could have liquid water on the surface. So in that sense, there will be Earth 2.0s. But in the sense of an atmosphere that's evolved to, you know, 80% nitrogen and 20% oxygen, and, uh, you know, all these things that are dependent, that we are dependent on environmental qualities, I'm skeptical that there'll be planets that are that similar. Um, so um, that kind of uh, makes that, sense to, I mean, at I don't know about in existence that there are none, but, you know, it seems like it's a particular moment in our own planet's history that it's just like this, that the atmosphere is perfectly just like this. And so if you think about all of the planets having these lifetimes, I don't know a better word to use, but if they have this, this whole That's evolutionary, you know, journey, yeah, th then you're looking for a tiny little moment in a, in a planet's life, it seems like. No, I, I, absolutely. In fact, uh, some of my colleagues have this saying, um, you know, the, 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 the ancient Earth is an exoplanet. Ah. You know, in other words, there hasn't just been one Earth. If you were an that. alien that had come here a billion years ago, you would have seen a really different atmosphere. And if you had come um, three billion years ago, you would have seen a really different atmosphere mm. with no free oxygen. Um, and it's life itself that has made Earth's atmosphere and other qualities of the planet so weird and in, in, in a lot of ways. And so, yeah, Earth has been changing and the details 
we're not going to find on another planet uh, exactly unless, the same way. Unless but. there's some kind of convergent evolution, right? Because, I mean, yeah. I, I, what you said something really interesting, which is that if you come back three billion years ago, it's a totally different planet, and life on the planet has shaped through biogeochemical cycles the atmospheric composition that is amenable to life. And so we, we talk about this all the time. Is it, it, it seems entirely possible that the window of possibilities for life and structures are bounded by, by physics and chemistry, right? They're bounded by these foundational principles. And so if you could go somewhere else and find a planet with life, it would have to look like us. Like there would be an octopus, there would be a human, there would be a, you know, there would be a monkey, a dolphin, a hamster, a porcupine, whatever on that other planet, because that is just the limitation of what it means for life to go through its program. Well, it's an interesting question. You know, what are the limits of convergence? I mean, you know, Stephen Jay Gould famously said that if you could play the tape of life on Earth over again, you wouldn't have the same biosphere. Um, and and I believe that. I think that I think Stephen Jay Gould's metaphor of the tape is a lousy one because a tape is a recording. It plays back the same every time. But if you could start the <laughs> process over again with all the randomness, it's more like, a, I don't know, a pachinko game, something with like things falling in random places. But um, the, uh, you know, there's so much contingency. I think there are niches. You would have something like an octopus. Maybe you'd have recognizable forms, but I doubt you, would, you know, it's, it's an interesting question. And there are, obviously there's a, um, there are differences of opinion. And there's a range of opinion on this amongst bio evolutionary biologists. So this is one of the questions when we come back to intelligence, is that a convergent property that, you know, just makes sense to evolve. But I, I think you're right, by the way, that there could be some degree of convergent evolution of of planetary biospheres. I actually wrote um, an essay about this where I started off saying we're not going to live in a Star Trek universe because of for the reasons I, I gave. And then I ended up coming around the end and saying, well, maybe it would be because I convinced myself, OK, if you had oxygen based life, uh, if you had photosynthesis, you'd start pumping oxygen into the atmosphere. But why do we have 20 percent oxygen? Well, supposedly that has to do with the uh, combustion limit of forests. If you had more than that, you'd have spontaneous combustion. So that convinced me, OK, so you might have other planets for those reasons that have something like 20% oxygen. So, that, you know, that there may be um, surprisingly Earth-like planets out there. I, I, I would concede that. <laughs> it, it totally gels with the idea that an organism doesn't exist in isolation. A species doesn't exist. And if, if, if Earth is an organism, then it should have brother and sister organisms whatever mother and daughter organisms whatever you it want should to have call. a family tree that family it, tree. it sits somewhere on yeah you would think yeah. so and no i i i agree with that my my fantasy for um you know i what i'm the people that i'm jealous of in my profession are the astrobiologists uh, of the future, hundreds of years from now, when we have, um, you know, 20 or 100 examples of inhabited planets and we can categorize them and put them in some kind of a family tree. Or, uh, you know, in astronomy, we have this thing called the HR diagram, the Hertzberg-Russell diagram, which has the life histories of stars. And we have the, you know, the old um, cool red ones over here and the hot young blue ones over here. And that, you know, we categorize them. And my fantasy is that, yeah, someday with planets and even with inhabited planets, we'll have that chart of, you know, here are the different types and here are the ones that are kind of like earth and the 20% oxygen ones. And here are the methane rich ones or whatever. Um, there ought to be a family tree, but, um, right now we can't populate it with anything like knowledge <laughs> only with speculation and modeling and fantasy I, I think it's worth remembering always that as far as i understand it we didn't think that anything existed outside the galaxy until the 1920s so we're at a Absolutely. we're at a hundred years of having a universe that expands beyond the milky way and so we're still so early in the process of understanding all of this and as you're born into the knowledge it seems like it's knowledge that humans have held for forever and there's something very finite and solved feeling about astrophysics and astronomy in general because these are objects that are in the sky for extended periods of time there is this very settled story of how they got there of how they're formed of how they persist of how they will die people write all these books about what the end of the universe will look like and so you go through it and you're like oh well i guess it's all figured out but just like any science we're kind of at this edge where 
new discoveries will force us to rewrite things. And it's going to be really interesting to see, like you said, 100 years from now, how are the foundational stories, even down to the Big Bang? What will these stories look like 100 years from now? Because there are... I don't think that we operate with any theories that are 100 years old for anything. No, and, um, you know, <laughs> there's a persistent phenomenon in in science where we always think that uh, what we know now is we've basically got it figured out yeah. and it's just down to the details. And they, you know, they thought that a hundred years ago um, and and a thousand, thousand years before out. that and 10,000 years before they, that. Well, yeah, yeah, kind of, but I mean, even so, so science is not a thousand years old, but, but certainly worldviews, cosmic exactly. explanations, we're, yeah, you know, exactly. we're pretty like, secure in their worldviews, but the even, earth even was born in, from the darkness by the goddess who yeah. carried the light. Like it was just like, well, yeah, obviously that's how this happened. And everybody was just like, but, well, yeah. but certainly contemporary science. I mean, we think like, yeah, well, we got to work out some things, but we basically got it. But then, you know, I read books. I'm not a cosmologist. I'm a planetary science scientist, but I read books about the big bang or the end of the universe or dark matter, dark energy. And I go like, really, you think that, well, yeah, I can see how that fits the evidence you have, but I'm not convinced you've really got it worked out in that 100 years from now we'll, we'll think all that. And and certainly in my own field, I know that it's in its infancy. I mean, it's just exoplanets. When I was in, in grad school, uh, we were taught um, there ought to be planets around other stars because everything we know about the sun um, tells us it's a normal star. And our understanding of the way the planets formed was sort of a natural byproduct of star formation. So there are those other stars, they should have planets, but we, we don't have any way to observe them. And now, of course, once we develop that observing capability, you know, boop, 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 they start popping out and we see, oh, we live in a galaxy full of exoplanets. So so our speculation turned out to be absolutely right. That, I think like, it's a lot more of an important part of science than people want to admit, really, is the imaginative, creative, hypothesis-generating stage. I mean, when I was in grad school, one of the things I witnessed, and I had a great lab and a great mentor and everything, but a lot of students had very little time to be creative and play with ideas that really you don't have any evidence for yet. That's your job, is to go out and, and see what's up. And uh, yeah, I, I wonder. Uh, I wonder why scientists are so afraid of, of of playing in the sandbox of ideas. You can't really make money off of the sandbox of ideas. Like you can't submit a grant to the NIH. But you need to play to have ideas to send off to the NIH. I'm, and this is something that we circle around all the time, right? It's like how we we we're. I feel like the process of training scientists is more and more settling into a process of of work, right? You see grad students unionizing at universities. Why are they unionizing? Well, they're unionizing because they're being used as workers. They're not being used as people who come and they're allowed to play and explore. And this was a, this was a fantasy that I had when I went to grad school where I was like, you know, I I work in a laboratory as as a tech, but I'm going to go to grad school and it's going to be a place where I can sit and ponder the mysteries of the universe. And that was not what grad school was for. Grad school was basically this high throughput process of becoming somebody who could do bench work, write papers, and get grants. And then would yeah, then I mean, event. Was... It felt like a pyramid scheme on some level. Yeah, honestly, I, I know what you're saying, and I and I see that all, all over the place. And I feel like I was kind of lucky in that. I was getting in on a new field. Mm, mm -hmm, Planetary mm -hmm. science was a new field. It still is, but when I um. Well, first of all, this is and kind I think of a that was weird... Shiloh's experience too. So I think that, like you know, two two anecdotes are now we're starting to edge on data. I mean, this, here's <laughs> a weird fact about me: I think I have the first ever undergraduate degree in planetary science, huh. as far as I know, because when I was an undergraduate, I I uh, applied for and got permission to make up my own major, which didn't That's exist, amazing. which I called planetary science, and then and then I went to grad school uh, in University University of Arizona in the planetary science department, which was fairly new, and I learned that none of my professors there themselves had degree in planetary science. They were had a degree in uh, geology or chemistry or physics or astronomy because planetary science did not exist when they were in grad school. So there's sort of a first and second generation thing. And I think maybe because of that, I didn't have the feeling of being so much of it because there wasn't sort of a factory yet. You know? Yeah, I was in a um, microbiology laboratory. I mean, like it's yeah. a it's a factory. It's just like there's there's a protein and there's a molecule, and you're going to figure out how they interact, and then you're going to write a paper about that, and then you're going to turn to a different molecule and figure out how they interact. And it's yeah. just kind of like, hmm. 
But, man, but I think a flip side of that being a new field is this kind of insecurity we talked about before. Sure, where yeah. You don't want to seem too speculative because you're trying to become respectable. And so because then you're you Graham know, Hancock. You you don't, yeah, <laughs> you don't talk about aliens as much. So, you know, but, but there's been a progression. So like I said, in grad school, they talk about exoplanets as this thing that we ought to be able to find someday. Uh, and they, they believe they existed, but they didn't have any actual observational evidence. And what's interesting is that right now I would put life, extraterrestrial life in that same category, where there's a lot of reasoned speculation, a lot of good arguments as to why it ought to exist by analogy with what's happened here. And by the fact that we can't find anything unusual really about earth that should prevent it from, you know, should make it so distinct. And yet we haven't observed it yet. So the question is, can we, can, just like we made that leap with exoplanets from speculation to observation. And once we learned how to observe it, it turned out the universe is full of them. Can we do that with extraterrestrial life? Um, we have these speculations. We have ideas about how to observe it. Can we start to find it? And once we do, maybe we'll find it everywhere. That seems like that's inherently part of what people call the scientific method, though, is this I mean, how can you, it must be part of the hypothesis. The speculation must be part of the hypothesis. I don't know how, what else it would be. It seems. I think that it's, it's the degree of speculation that we should learn to be comfortable with, because I feel like very often inside of established fields, the degree of speculation is very, very narrow. And you have this window of what you're allowed to say. And I think that this was uh, something that Lynn Margulis came across when she was working on the endosymbiont hypothesis. It was, or, or Lovelock was working on the Gaia hypothesis. It's like these weren't things that you say because they were so far beyond what could be evident, proven with evidence. Mm. And science is right. fundamentally... You want to have something testable. And in order for it to be um, science... Um, you know, we we think of it, you have to be able to make a prediction, do an experiment, uh, verify or refute the idea. And that's, you know, there's some ideas that are really good ideas, but hard to test. And I would put Gaia in that mm -hmm. in that um, category. It's clearly a good idea and it's changed the way we think about evolution and life. And uh, it's important. But what one experiment can you propose that's going to say, well, if this, you know, it's either going to confirm or refute the Gaia hypothesis. I mean, I again, once I have once I'm my future astronaut biologists with a hundred planets to talk about and categorize, then I think I'll have the <laughs> evidence for that. But yeah. I think, the, I think the test would be, are there others really? That, that right. seems like a reasonable test to offer. It's like, that's, that's the best test. I mean, people have talked about, you know, different kind of re-examining earth history and stability and homeostasis and all that. Um, but it's hard to really be predictive about it without um, other examples. Yeah, I mean, we we had this conversation. We had um, Gavin Schmidt on the show where we were talking about the Silurian hypothesis, and we brought and we brought the Gaia hypothesis into the conversation. And he kind of got upset about it. He was like, "This isn't a fruitful, productive way to be thinking because there's nothing that can be done in terms of." moving science forward. It's a philosophical argument that people are just going to get lost in. And I understand where he's coming from on some level, right? Because he's coming- I understand where he's coming from. And Gavin, Gavin's a, a friend of mine. I like him a lot and I think he's really smart, but I disagree with him about the value of Gaia. Um, and I do agree. It's In a way, it's more of a philosophical idea than a scientific idea. Or I would describe it as an idea of natural philosophy, which is sort mm -hmm. of right on the boundary between the two. Uh, and it's challenging if you think of it as just a scientific idea that's worthless if I can't test it. And maybe that's a little bit where Gavin's coming from. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I could see where that would be frustrating. But if it's... It doesn't seem technological. Way, it doesn't seem like technological. I don't know what the word is. <laughs> that's a good word, yeah. It doesn't seem like he can immediately, like, technologize it in a way. I think that's what he was upset about. He's like, it's a useless idea or something like that, too. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, and it's like... People, there have been a lot of problems with the way Gaia has been discussed, and it's been a sort of squishy concept that people mean different things when they uh, when they describe it. And there's a lot of scientists that have become sort of impatient with discussions of Gaia, which I think is too bad because I think at its core, there's some really important problems that even if you some really important um, ideas in Gaia that even if you can't test it with one uh, prediction in the absence of a hundred inhabited planets, which we'll be able to. Do someday, I think it can guide the way we think about life and even guide the way we do science. And I, and I think that it's very important for the way we think about extraterrestrial life. And in that sense, it can be 
used in a practical way when we're building space telescopes and experiments. I think that um, if we don't think of life as something that changes planets, if we just think of planets as environments where there could be life and not environments that are made by life and changed by life, then we're going to be thinking of inhabited planets the wrong way. And that's a way in which the Gaia hypothesis in its deepest meaning absolutely is essential for astrobiology. And whether people realize it or not, all these people searching for uh, atmospheric biosignatures and signs of disequilibrium, they are applying Gaia theory to astrobiology, whether they um, are aware that and whether they call it that or not. How much do you stay abreast of the news from SETI? We we just had Avi Loeb on the show the other day, and he's absolutely convinced that the best way to look for life is to imagine that life is intelligent like us and that we should basically be looking for really better versions of ourselves out there as opposed to looking for these molecular traces and things like that. Do you, what, what's your... What's your position? Well, I on... think it's I think it's silly to make a definitive statement about that. I think that uh, we ought to explore broadly because we have no idea what's out there. And you can have an opinion about that, but it's not an informed opinion. You know, there are people that believe um, that we ought to re- just be looking for microbes because the chance of uh, so-called intelligence um, is so slim compared to that. Um, and then there are other people with the opposite opinion. And the, uh, the honest answer is that we, we just don't know um, that it makes sense to, if we can look for microbes, if we can look for atmospheric traces of, of, bio, of microbial biospheres, we, we should. And there, there is an argument that um, some fraction of life in the universe will have gained technological intelligence and therefore made itself much more visible. That's really what Avi's saying. I think it's a decent argument. And I think it would be foolish of us not to look for that kind of life also. But I don't think you need to build up one at the expense of the other, given given our ignorance. It's certainly true that um, that if um, you know, by the same kinds of arguments that you believe there's life elsewhere because there's nothing unusual about um, Earth that made life, um, there's really nothing we know that prevents the evolution of technological intelligence from happening elsewhere. And that could indeed transform planets um, observationally in ways that are very profound. I I would disagree um, if Avi really said we should look for intelligence that's like us, because I think we're probably very, very um, young as an intelligence. In other words, if there is if there are multiple examples, if the universe is full of technological intelligent life, then it's going to be a very rare thing to find anyone as young as we are, since we're so young as a technological species. So almost all of them will be more, you know, going back to the word mature. And that's probably a good thing because if, you know, they'll have had technology, they'll have had powerful planet changing technology long enough so that they'll either have learned to live with it, which is something we need to do, or they won't be around anymore. So I actually think that it's more likely that we'll find creatures that are like what we want to become than like what we are now in our sort of unstable configuration where we're just trying to figure out, you know, can we do this planetary civilization thing with our, with our technology? I th- well, what's really interesting is he's speaking to physicists and astronomers, which, by the way, it's kind of interesting that astronomers and physicists are often the same group of people. And I think he's sort of being like, guys, maybe a lot of the stuff you're seeing is biological in nature. I mean, he doesn't say it like that, but I think that's essentially what he's saying. Like, what if we start examining these anomalous processes that we observe in the sky as not fundamentally physical processes, but biophysical processes? Yeah. And- yeah. I mean, it's it's certainly something that we ought to think about. Um, you know, there's there's a bias And we should think through whether it's a correct one, that biology is the explanation of last resort. Mm. Um, You know, it's sort of the Carl Sagan, um, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence that if you if something if you just can't understand something and you go, aha, it's aliens. You're like the guy with the the funny hair, you know, (laughs) Um, and it's a little bit like the whole sort of ancient astronauts things like, oh, they couldn't possibly have built the 
pyramids, you know, it must be aliens, you know, just, just because something is mysterious to us doesn't mean you have to invoke aliens. So mm. that's, that's the argument against it. Nonetheless, I think there's, but you can't rule it out too by the same logic. It's just like absolutely, yeah. and and we do tend to rule it out. Our scientists do tend to rule it out, and I think in that sense, Avi is absolutely right that that we need to be open to biological hypotheses um, and treat them, you know, not as these sort of just like completely freak, um, you know, extremely improbable. Um, just don't treat them as unscientific, yeah. Causes, but treat that, you know, say, okay, so if that's your hypothesis, then what, what, what else would you observe? Mm, you know, like try that. to try to try to test it. So, if life on Earth is representative of a planetary organism, a la the Gaia hypothesis, then the organism will one day die because that's what organisms do. Nothing is immortal. And if that organism and that organ and I can imagine many different ways for that to happen, right? Like the the Earth we definitely know is changing; it's losing its atmosphere. Uh, the sun will at some point expand and swallow Earth. There's we might fight ourselves to death. That seems to me to imply a necessity to leave the planet and to go forward. Because even if we were to die and to not do that, I imagine that there would be a spreading of seed through the universe by way of panspermia. Bacterial spores can survive in space just fine. It's probably already happening. So because there's there's back there's spore forming bacteria in the atmosphere. And so I can imagine them easily being blown away. We're not looking, but I, I imagine that we'll find it when it's there. Does that suggest that there is a a a huge imperative to have humans leave the planet? Because if bacteria are the only ones that leave the planet, they leave the planet without the accumulated library of wisdom. That sense organ. <laughs> without the, it's not even necessarily the sense organ. I think that humans are the scribes. They're the ones that write it down and they have a language for being able to, to, to well, talk like about the things self-aware, that the self-aware thing that we were talking about. Before. I mean, I, I, I didn't get to say that I kind of disagreed with it at the time because I, I, I think that hum, everybody is a sense organ. Humans are the catalogers. We're the scribes. We're the so note takers. self-awareness or the bacteria like, I'm a bacteria. I think they <laughs> are. I, th I don't know. I know that's stupid, but I think Maybe. they are. But I no, guess... I hear, I hear what you're saying. Uh, that, that um, th You know, yes, uh, Gaia... Uh, at least if you define Gaia as a biosphere on Earth, it will die someday. If you allow for the fact that maybe it'll reproduce and bits of it will go move off somewhere and live on. And that way, maybe it won't have to die. I guess it depends on how you're defining, um, you know, the, the unit <laughs> of Gaia. But, um, you know, but, yeah, by that I, definition, I, none of us have ever died, I guess, since yeah. there's a continuous cell going all the way That's back. That's right. But I, you know, but I think that if you identify with Gaia as opposed to identifying with um, an individual species or an individual um, self, human self, then there is a sense in which we uh, do have a kind of immortality that we've been, that, that we've been um, you and I as part of Gaia have been here for four billion years or so. Um, and you know, from that perspective, yeah, um, it would be, I think. Yeah, maybe she even came from somewhere else before that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So so I think there is kind of an imperative to um, to keep going and to survive. I think that's a very basic drive that life has. And so, yeah, I think that, um, I mean, we've got plenty of time before these things happen, um, like the sun you know, uh, evolving to the point where it makes life on earth, um, impossible or the atmosphere evolving in some irreversible way. You know, the, none of those are immediate threats to the biosphere, you know, an asteroid impact is a more immediate threat, but we, that we're almost already at the point where we could see it coming and bat it out of the way. So our real immediate threats are self-induced. Um, and I'm not a fan of sort of running off to other planets, um, running away from our self-induced problems. So I feel like, um, you know, as Carl Sagan said, earth is where we make our stand. But I think that's true about we as contemporary humans, but as, you know, as agents of the biosphere in the long run, I do think that um, there's every reason to believe that we'll want to um, go out and start self-sustaining um, inhabitants <laughs> elsewhere. Um, and, um, 
and and I think that 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 it's likely that that if we get through this sort of technological bottleneck we're in now and really make it through the next century or two and and develop a sort of more mature healthy relationship with our you know with our uh, our planet and our um, technological presence learn how to kind of integrate the two in a healthy way then i think we're uh, going to be around for a long time maybe even sort of the rest of the life of the planet and and therefore we'll have time to uh, figure out also how to expand off planet i see it more on that kind of evolutionary time scale than something that we're going to I mean, I know there are people that have plans to try to build self-sustaining uh, cities on Mars in the next, uh, uh, you know, decade or two, and g- uh, good luck to them. But I think that um, I, it, that it's a, a sort of I see it as a longer-term process that will sort of, for real, um, become a more mature species on Earth, and then start to kind of move out and in, inhabit the rest of the universe. Right on. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic place to to stop to leave. You're a busy man. We gotta let you go. But where can folks find out more about your work? What's this, what's in the pipes for you? Do you? Are you working on a new book or anything cool you want to share with people? Or? Yeah, I have a couple of books that are in the works, but nothing that's sort of ready for prime time. All right. um, I'm part of the Da Vinci mission to Venus, which you can go online and find out about. You can follow me. Um, uh, at least as of today, I'm still on Twitter, and that's uh, I'm a, a doc, Dr. Funky Spoon, Dr. Funky Spoon. Um, you know, I've got a website which is funkyscience.net, um, and certainly you can check out uh, Earth and Human Hands, which is my book that um, explores a, actually a lot of what we've been talking about today, um, different aspects of that. So uh, that that might be a good good place to start. Awesome, folks. We will put those links in the description. And David, again, thank you so much. It's been really cool to talk to you. Hopefully we can catch up down the road a little bit. I hope so. I've enjoyed talking to you. Great. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.